All right, welcome to today's video. We're gonna focus on two major things that have some kind of other little things mixed in. Essentially, we're gonna be doing a track day debrief mixed in with some actual things we're gonna do. So last track day at Circuit of the Americas was the first time I ran the car in a year. Everything went really well for the first day. Well, not really well, but mostly well for the first day. And then for the second day, I made it like one session and one lap before I broke the car. Um, fortunately, it was not the motor, so <laughs> that's good. Um, always worried about that. But um, this time we broke a rear upper control, nope, rear upper camber arm. So um, the, I was running some units from FTBR and they just snapped in half uh, due to fatigue. I'll show you some clips here as you can see. Um, it very slowly started to fatigue and then eventually hit a point where it just had too much pressure for the amount of fatigue that it had and it snapped the bolt clear in half. So that ended our weekend quite early. But we had gotten enough in to kind of, you know, make sure the engine worked and kind of see how the car was going to behave. Uh, the other thing that I, as I referenced with it being mostly well, is I was having a vacuum problem. So, well, I guess I should say the real problem is I was having issues with the brakes. Um, where after extended wide open throttle, so specifically at Coda, it happened mostly after the back straightaway and after the front straightaway. I, I had a couple times where I, I ran into a dead pedal, if you will, a hard pedal. So... We're gonna do two things. Um, one is I uh, we're gonna inspect the brakes and see how they look. Um, the second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, check the vacuum on it because I think it's a vacuum issue since we did the VCT lockouts, which essentially uh, converts the variable cam timing to uh, the equivalent to the way we have everything degreed as a really big cam and a standard motor. And anybody who's been around, um, you know, old classic V8s and stuff or pushrod engines knows if you put a really big cam in it, you lose vacuum at idle. So I think that's what we're dealing with. So we're going to approach that and, and stuff like that, as well as fix that rear camber on my bro. So let's get started. All right. So here we go. We have the SPC upper or rear camber arm. I don't know why I keep adding upper. I think I keep trying to say upper control arm. Rear camber arm uh, replacement. So for the life of me, I cannot find any of the OEM pieces I have. Either the OEM one I had that had solid bushings in it or the just plain OEM. I must have gotten rid of them at some point or lost them in the move or, or something like that. So I no longer have those um, to compare, but I'll throw a picture up on the screen that uh, a friend in the community sent me to show you that this is quite a bit beefier um, as a result of it being aluminum is my understanding. Um, that said though, uh, a stock arm is, I think it's four, uh, four pounds, 12 ounces. This comes in just under a three pounds, uh, 12 ounces, like three pounds, 11 ounces and something, something. So this is just about a pound lighter. Um, I have not weighed this. Um, but I would guess this piece comes in uh, closer to that stock piece. It's not very, it's not definitely not any lighter uh, than this. This is definitely lighter. So um, that's, a, that's a benefit. Um, I'm sure many of the other stock pieces out there are going to be equivalently light. But, or I should say aftermarket pieces, nice aftermarket pieces are going to be equivalently light. So I ran this guy, this full tilt boogie arm uh, for two years. And last track day, I had it snap on me about right here. I was very fortunate where it broke that it didn't send me into a bad um, a bad situation. It just spun the car around. It was generally just a little bit of damage to one of the, the wheels and to a shock mount. But generally, we're all good. Um, I'll throw some pictures up on the screen of what that looked like it broke. Fortunately, Full Tilt Boogie sent me new threads here. Uh, they've treated me fantastic, and I'm told there's a redesign um, upcoming. So uh, if you're worried about that part breaking, um, there should be an upgraded part out eventually. But I'm switching over to these. In the meantime, we'll see what happens here and, and, and with other vendors and stuff. But for now, I'm switching to this to give it a try. I liked a couple things about it. One, this SPC part uh, utilizes the OEM OEM inspired design here. It's a little different, but it's generally similar. And what I like is it's very robust. I mean, this is a very strong, robust piece. I would be shocked if we have any problems with this. Very, um, very, very nice in that area. And then it fixes my complaints about the OEM piece in two key areas. 
One, adjustability. If you've ever adjusted rear camber on an S550, you know you're dealing with a, uh, basically loosening a bolt, sliding it in a slot, and retightening it. The problem is, even if you manage to get it into the right spot, as soon as you tighten it, it moved on you. It was a nightmare. And then second is, if you track your car hard, it's actually possible for it to move on you. So I had mine slide in the slot on me. So I went over a turn at the ridge in Washington, uh, I think it was turn three, and the car just kicked out on me, went into the pits and found out I was running like negative four camber in the rear. It was ridiculous. So what I like about this is it fixes that in two ways. Um, one, it moves the adjust, it moves part of the adjustability, the fine adjustability, to this part, the part that goes on the knuckle itself, which I'll show you when we when we get it installed. And then the second is it uses this little plate here or the you know the other one depending on how you want it adjusted uh, to lock out that slot. Or I guess it would. Yeah, it would be like this. So this slot gets locked out, so it can't move. So there's no way it's gonna slide around in that slot, and then um, your finite adjustments are done here. So this is a really nice piece. I'm really happy with it. Obviously, having this type of adjustability is really nice, but uh, for me, with how hard the, the car gets driven on the racetrack, I want something a little more robust. So this takes the robustness of the OEM part and uh, fixes its adjustment problems. Okay, so it's a little more involved to set up just because of the, the, the way it works. Uh, the adjustability is done on two parts, one here on the inside, depending on which one of these little um, lockouts you choose, and then with this eccentric part here that you do finite adjustment. So you pick the general range you wanna be working from, kind of where your zero area is, like your, your like, uh, neutral, or your, your default camber is, and then you fine tune your camber with the eccentric part here. So let's say at, you know, with it on the OEM negative slot, full negative camber setting, you're at negative 2.5. So what you do is you figure out based on this graph, how much you wanna, do you wanna add to that? You can go a little bit more than negative 2.5 or you can go less than. I wanna be running about negative two. Uh, right around there, you know, plus plus or minus a, a degree, you know, a tenth of a degree or so. So that means if we look at the little graph here, if we go, if we're at negative two and a half at the zero adjustment, uh, and I want to remove half a degree from this, that means I want to be A3, which means I put the, the lockout in the A position down here, the little, I forget what they call this thing. Um, it's an insert, but yeah, you put the insert, uh, in the A position, and then you you get the uh, the little lockout plate that enables you to put it in the third position. And so if you look closely, you can see that there's the little gap there. This one's all the way over. Let me grab another one. So if you look at these two, you can see they're slightly different. So you have this one is the one all the way over. So it would act as one or as four. So since we're doing three, we're gonna ours is gonna work this way as if we were doing it from the left side. Um, uh, if, yeah. So if we were, you know, if we're doing right side, it's a little different. But of course, um, this is the one we want. And then over here, if you look, um, the the placement is towards the inside. So if this is the the right side inboard. All right. And so if you see here we have that we're at the A where it's pointing inwards, we're at the maximum camber setting. So A here, so we'll put this in the slot and then we'll get our short bolt and we'll put it this way so um, we're uh, pretty negative here on the camber um, when we lock. All right, so if we look in here and we look right here, this between these two holes is that OEM slot. And if you take the bolt, you'll see here um, with the lockout, like that, we want it so that we're deeper in there. That means, sorry, let me try to get that out of the light. That means we want it like this, where there's more distance on the front here than the back. So it would go in more or less like that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and install the, the arm in between here, then put this bolt in and start to tighten that down and that'll, um, then we can move to the outside. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Unfortunately, I don't have a way to hold the camera up while I'm doing it, so um, I'll just show you what it looks like when I'm done. All right, so we got the rear camber arm interior bolt installed in the slot. So one of the things you need to do, or they recommend is not tightening it all the way until you get it installed in that knuckle side and 
Otherwise, you put a little bit too much stress on the bushings, I guess, um, which makes sense. All right, so uh, now that we've got this one installed, we can move to the knuckle. All right, and because this end has the most mass, I've put a plus there, and this end is the thinnest, I've put a minus there. Uh, and that will help me, when it's installed, have a general idea of where things are so I know which way to turn it. All right, so installing this is actually pretty easy. So we just need to, just need to first, I'm uh, gonna slide this in here, and I'm gonna orient mine. And I'm gonna orient mine so the plus and minus are at exactly 180 degree opposite. So we're right in the middle of the adjustment. Um, and so then all we need to do is Stick the bolt in. All right, so then all we need to do is bring it up, get it into this part of the knuckle, put the nut in, start to tighten it down. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and get it started, and then we'll talk about it uh, once I get it finished. All right, so now that we got that in, we should be able to, or we should be good to go. When I need to adjust it, um, I'm just gonna loosen this bolt and then I don't know how well it's gonna show up on camera, but you just rotate this essentially what looks like a giant nut. Uh, SPC recommends you get a one and a half inch uh, diameter uh, ultra thin wrench. I've bought one off of Amazon. SPC also sells one, recommend buying that when you buy the, the part, but essentially you get this really thin wrench that goes in here and enables you to adjust that. Um, you just loosen this, you adjust it. So. Of course, you gotta take the wheel off to do that adjustment, at least I, I would assume you do. Um, so keep in mind, these aren't meant for quick adjustment. They're just more meant to not move on you um, once you've gotten them adjusted, which I think is good, as well as they will be more, uh, uh, they will be more precise, right? So no time at any point when I was adjusting these, or I should say tightening these, did it move on me. It's stuck in the exact same spot, which is really key, because like I said, with the OEM parts are gonna move on you. So uh, I'm a little bit away, I'm a little bit away from uh, dropping this thing down all the way onto the ground. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish up what else I have to do real quick, just vacuum some stuff, clean some stuff up, and then we'll put the tires down on it and we'll drop it onto the ground and generally see where it is. Acknowledging the fact that we're gonna have to, um, you know, roll it around and, and settle the suspension back uh, before we have a final measurement. But that'll at least give us an idea of where we're at. All right, so got the car down, moved it back and forth a little bit just to let everything level out and kind of see where we're at. And we're right on the money, so we're right at two. The other side's a little bit higher, so I'll have to go ahead and adjust that. But uh, we're looking really good. So, I like I said, I really wanted to land right about uh, two degrees. And then just to show you what the wrench looks like, the wrench came in today. Um, so this is what it is. So you can see it's quite skinny for the size of it. It's an inch and a half, um, and it's a, you know about as thick as your average like 10 millimeter wrench. Um, much much thinner than say. You know, here's an, uh, an inch and 16. Um, I don't, yeah, you can kind of see them. So much thinner. So that'll allow us to, A, the, the short length here is, is good for adjustability, and two, you know, that'll fit right into that slot. Oh, let me adjust that. So if you do get these, make sure you get one of these. Okay, so while the engine's heating up right now, so I can do an oil change, I'm pulling vacuum on it, or checking vacuum. And you can see here we're at um, like 16. And earlier while it was idling really high about, I wanna say about 1100, uh, 1400 in that range, when it was still cold, it was down here at about 11. So that is definitely my leading, uh, my leading idea of why we're having the hard brakes because we're just not pulling enough vacuum on the master cylinder or the brake booster, sorry. So that's my guess. Um, I do, I, I sent this information to the tuner and he made some changes to the tune because if you see it fluctuates. So one of the things I did at an earlier point when I was testing with a buddy, is we were able to get the engine to stutter a little bit going on and off throttle. Uh, and the, the vacuum would just dip really low during that time. So we're, I'm hoping that if we can get rid of that stutter, that might give us enough uh, stability with the, uh, uh, potentially with something like a, a canister that will add vacuum 
uh, or add vacuum capacity to fill in that gap. But we might need to go to a vacuum pump just to augment the fact that this engine, it doesn't produce enough vacuum. So kind of two paths forward, I think, um, is to either add an electric vacuum pump that only comes on when vacuum drops below uh, a certain threshold, or to try adding a vacuum canister, which stores about you know half as much to, to twice as much vacuum um, so that there's more vacuum for the system to utilize when you're pushing the car really hard on the racetrack. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this up on the lift here and we'll get the oil draining out of it. All right, so just did the oil change in the car and while the oil change is happening, I have the updated tune here from the tuner going into the car to hopefully be able to help with those that little hesitation, just do some little minor cleanup stuff, some you know, cold start cleanup as well as see if that affects the uh, the vacuum it's pulling. Because as I mentioned, I don't know how well it came through, but as I mentioned, um, if you if you would play with the throttle a little bit, such as get it right around 1,000 RPM, vacuum was great. It was like 18-inch uh, vacuum. I mean, that's not as great as it would be if it still had VCT, but it's not bad. Um, but if you got it to flutter around 1,200 RPM, it would drop to 10 at, you know, it just, it moved around depending on kind of how the car was running. So we were able to data log it when it was having a little bit of issue and, and down at the, you know, idling and stuff and, and sent that to the tuner. And he was able to take a look at that and clean it up. So hoping that this new uh, revision will help clean some of that up, which will then improve our situation with, um, vacuum so i'm gonna go ahead and start the car now get the oil circulating through the system get it back into the accu sump in the trunk all that kind of stuff as well as we'll go take a look at the uh the vacuum cage up there and see if it helped at all So I think I got a place here for this vacuum canister. So um, I'm going to install it. Let me get it. I'm getting. I'm basically going to install it sideways in here in this area going through this little plate I've added to block off. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, that was where the, the intake for the HVAC inside, you know, the climate stuff was for the inside. So I'm going to go ahead and mount it in there um, sideways like this. This will give it good room, tuck it out of the way. Uh, hopefully reduce its exposure to heat as much as one can in this particular engine bay. Um, I've also switched the side that we're going to be pulling off the intake. So we're going to be pulling from the uh, the passenger side here. It's going to come through here and then I'm going to run a line from here to here for the canister and then run a line from this side um, over to the brake booster. Obviously it would be fantastic to, to be able to get the uh, the canister closer to the vacuum uh, boost or to the brake booster but I have no idea how to try to fit that anywhere near there. Um, the closest I could think of was potentially behind the wheel in the vent area you know, under, you know, in the fender here, but it was really, really tight uh, trying to fit that, you know, down in there. To, so I, I don't think that would work. This thing's just uh, too big. A smaller one might, but then that's less effective. So we're going to go ahead and give this a shot. And then the other thing too, is I found this really cool gauge, which I'll show um, at another point, probably not in this video, because it's going to take a while to get it, but I'm going to install a gauge into this so I can monitor the vacuum. Um, and it'll be great because it, you know, it's got a, um, a provision for it and this particular gauge has a warning So it measures from 0 to 30 inch of inches of vacuum and then you can program a warning light on it to tell you uh, That'll come on when the you know, the vacuum is uh, below a certain threshold and it's programmable So I'll be able to set it, you know, throw a warning code um, when we go when we drop below like 10 in the canister and that way if I'm ever going towards a big braking zone and that light comes on I'll know that okay I need to let off a little bit before because one of the things I learned on at the track uh, last time was if I lifted you know one to two seconds of coasting before I got on the brakes I I never had a problem. It was only when I went from straight from throttle to brake application that the engine hadn't produced enough vacuum during that time to supply the, the, the brake booster. So hopefully this solves that issue. 
Um, we'll see. All right, so to go ahead and install this, I've made a little plate to put on the back of this because it's not very thick. Um, and well, as well, this will help me uh, figure out where to, uh, where to drill. So I'm gonna try to tackle this from inside the car, just go underneath the, uh, the dash in here since I have no glove compartment. But essentially, I just cut a little piece of flat um, aluminum here, flat stock, uh, set it up to go through. So I'm gonna go in here. I generally know within that thing where I want it to go. So I'm gonna go in and, and install this from the inside, cut through, and then we'll try to get this mounted and see how that works out. So I'll be right back with you. All right, so we now have the canister installed, as you can see here, got it installed up against the firewall. Uh, nice about half inch to three quarters of an inch clearance from this guy. This is nice and tucked away, so we shouldn't have any issues with heat, at least I'm hoping. Um, and then of course that doesn't really get too hot. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it. And then we have the lines running. I've swapped over the lines on the intake manifold. So normally the line that goes to your brake booster is going to be on here on the driver's side. I flipped it over. Um, so it's on here on the passenger side goes, you know, pulls vacuum into the canister. Um, and this line, um, the intake manifold line runs to the, the check valve. So once it pulls vacuum, the canister isn't able to pull air back into it. And then the, the line going out of the canister runs to the brake booster, which has another check valve. So that once air has been, um, or once the, the vacuum has been depleted in the brake booster, it can suck more or more vacuum can get sucked this way. Um, at it, you know, utilizing the, the canister here. Essentially, these work, from my understanding at least, these work as uh, one, you know, giant reservoir rather than replenishing. So whatever you have in, uh, in the canister is what will be in there and vice versa. So uh, it's not like once that runs out, it then opens up this one. These will be the same um, amount of vacuum. All right, and then, And then if we come inside the car here, you can see that plate that I, that you know, that piece of flat aluminum there that I used to, to mount it. So that is nice and solid. It's not gonna be going anywhere and I feel really good about that. And then just one note um, as far as one other thing I'm gonna add is I have a little gauge from Speed Hut on the way that will plug into that canister and it'll tell me the vacuum that is in that canister. I'll put it inside the car, it'll, get, it'll let me know if I'm at 10, 12, 15, 20 vac inches of vacuum. And the great part is it's an electronic one with a warning light. So I can set it so a vacuum drops below a specific threshold, a little orange light comes on, flashes and lets me know. So that'll be great. I'll play around with that this weekend if I'm able to get installed in time. But hopefully we'll be able to figure out kind of what vacuum levels are are worrying and I can put a warning there. So even if this you know setup does result in some or doesn't fix our, our brake issue, I'll at least have an idea going into a corner if I'm running into if if I'm not gonna have enough vacuum. Plus that'll help us ensure that if I have a dead pedal but a lot of vacuum, we'll know what's going on. All right, so that's gonna do it for this video. As you can see, got those new uh, rear camber links in, camber arms, whatever the hell they're called, um, as well as hopefully something that works with the, the uh, vacuum canister. Hopefully that's gonna work for us. So the next uh, the next event is gonna be Coda here in just under two weeks. Hopefully, you know, the things things will work out with the vacuum canister. If not, we'll have to explore, you know, putting in a vacuum pump or something like that for the next time. But um, I might do another video in between this and when I go to Coda, if I get the gauge, the, the vacuum gauge that allows me to see, you know, the vacuum in the canister in real time. And I'll, of course, record that and, and upload that for you guys to show what that looks like. But if not, we'll just go straight to Coda and see how it works. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Please holler if you have any questions. As always, any suggestions, questions, all that kind of stuff. I'm always happy to help. All right. Catch you at the racetrack. <laughs>